I really ought to say I'm not a Greek a scholar. Uh, in worse, I'm not. I, I have an utterly unscholarly mind, um, and uh, but I've been thinking uh, about uh, Plato uh, at least since the um, mid '70s, uh, and uh, only recently, I have to say, uh, I took part in a seminar. Uh, at King's College London uh, with some Greek philosophers on the Gorgias. When I say recently, it was a month after September 11th. Uh, and the, uh, the Gorgias, is, as you'll he hear me talk about, is, is, is a dialogue in which uh, Plato has his Socrates say uh, that it's better to suffer evil than to do it. Uh, and uh, I was really struck by the fact that uh, none of the students uh, in, that, in that lecture, they're all Greek philosophy students uh, in that seminar, uh, needed, to, needed any kind of reminding that this was a, a, a dialogue uh, unnervingly uh, relevant indeed to, to what was happening uh, because of the implications of that doctrine politically that it's better to suffer evil than to do it uh, it's essentially a doctrine of renunciation, uh, which includes renunciation of certain kinds of means to defend yourself, any unjust means to defend yourself. Uh, none of us, uh, I have to say, uh, realise that within months people would be suggesting that we might torture terrorists in order to save our lives uh, should they be, provide us with information. But that was an electrifying occasion, and if ever... Uh, I, well, I, I never needed telling, but let's put it, if I ever needed telling that uh, pa Plato ought not to be regarded as the patriarch of dead white males uh, to be contrasted with other human beings, uh, then that was uh, one occasion. Um, Alfred North Whitehead, uh, who was a collaborator with Russell uh, on uh, Principia Mathematica, uh, said of Plato that by the way, how long do I go to seven? After, yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, said, uh, said of uh, Plato that um, the whole of Western philosophy is really a footnote to him. Uh, so if, if that were only even 10% true, he, there would be no further need to justify his place uh, in a, a, a series on key thinkers. But he's not at all a popular uh, philosopher these days, not at least amongst analytical philosophers, that is, uh, philosophers uh, trained in a sort of tradition that's dominated uh, British uh, and American philosophical thought. Uh, and that's for two reasons, or I mean, in fact, uh, there are more than two reasons, but there are two that I'm going to focus on. Uh, one is that there's an intensity uh, in Plato and in his character Socrates uh, that uh, a number of people now find and not only unnerving, but indeed distasteful, uh, uh, because against, against that intensity, uh, they prefer an ideal of a kind of cool urbanity. Uh, and uh, there's nothing uh, urbane about, at least I don't think there's anything urbane, about Plato's Socrates. Uh, and uh, the ideal of a kind of urbane uh, moral philosophy that condescends to uh, too much intensity uh, has become, uh, has, has dominated uh, analytical uh, moral philosophy, uh, which for the most part is quite determined to say that morality must find its place uh, and make sure it stays there. So that's one reason. Uh, although... Uh, I, I don't want to say that that's a characteristic of the times as such. Um, Gassan mentioned a book I wrote called Romulus, My Father. And in that book, I described my father and his very good friend, a uh, uh, man called Hora, uh, as living a life that expressed the thought that nothing, nothing mattered more uh, than to live one's life decently, uh, where, uh, as I said, nothing really meant nothing. Uh, and elsewhere, I've, I've suggested that that expresses much the same thought as the Socratic uh, idea that it's better to suffer evil than to do it. And in fact, in that same book, uh, I attributed that same belief uh, to my father. 
and uh, the reception of that book uh, has heartened me uh, that the condescension that discloses itself in a certain kind of ideal of urbanity hasn't been entirely uh, successful in, as it were, colonizing the moral space. The second reason is that there's, a, amongst analytical philosophers especially, there's a distrust uh, of the fact that uh, Plato writes in dialogues. Uh, and they think the dialogues are, are for the most part, um, just ways of dressing up uh, rather bad arguments um, in, in, uh, presented through the mouth of Socrates. Uh, and Plato himself, uh, as you probably, if, if you're not philosophers, you'll probably know, one of the things you'll know about Plato, I'm pretty sure, is that in his Republic he banned anything that we would now call serious art. Uh, and in fact, in the Republic, he says, he talks about an ancient quarrel uh, between poetry, in which he includes things like the Iliad, it's the old Greek notion of poetry, ancient quarrel between poetry and philosophy. And in that book, he's Socrates, that is the character Socrates drawn by Plato, uh, makes it clear that that quarrel uh, ought to be settled uh, unambiguously in favor of philosophy. Uh, but that, that was a quarrel that was, was, was very, uh, went very powerfully in Plato's own breast. Uh, and I think it's only uh, because he was torn between the poet and the philosopher in himself, the poet and the metaphysician. Uh, it's only because of that that Socrates has survived as a character uh, to haunt the Western imagination. Uh, and I'm going to be talking, uh, in fact, uh, in this talk, though it's, it's billed as talking about Plato, I'm going to be talking about Plato's character, Socrates, uh, more or less as if if I were giving a, a, a lecture on uh, Tolstoy, I might talk about Levin or Anna Karenina, uh, a creation of Tolstoy's. But when one's thinking about Plato, one has to think about Socrates, the actual person uh, who inspired the actual Plato. One has to think about the character in the dialogues. Uh, we ha one has to think about the arguments put forward by the character in those dialogues, and I tend to agree with philosophers who think they're mostly bad uh, arguments. And one has to think of Plato's attitude uh, to all these, uh, to the actual historical Socrates, to his character, and to what his character professes. Uh, now, of a man, the only thing I'll say is that I think there are three things that the actual Socrates believed. Uh, that are represented also by the character and that inspired Plato, at least in his ethical writings. Uh, one is the famous remark at his trial uh, that the unexamined life is unworthy of a human being. Uh, another that I'm going to discuss is that it's better to suffer evil than to do it. Uh, and another that's hardly ever discussed uh, at all, but which Socrates said at his trial was the one truth, he called it the one truth, uh, which he said, a good man can't be harmed, not in this life or the next. And I'll talk a little bit about those three. But I think a large part of Plato's explicitly moral philosophy uh, is a kind of response to that, and sometimes an attempt, many attempts in fact, not, 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 not just doing one thing, but many, many attempts to try to make sense of some of that, especially the last claim the good man can't be harmed, which Aristotle dismissed as something absurd, and that only that someone who was arguing for a thesis at all costs could possibly proclaim. Sometimes uh, the character uh, stands uh, in conflict with uh, things the character professes, or at any rate, uh, stands in conflict with things the character is standardly taken to profess. And, uh, I'll give you uh, one example of that. Uh, in order to, once uh, to, uh, in, a, in a fine book called Socrates, uh, uh, a scholar, Gregory Vastos, has this to say in his attempt to characterize Socratic passion. This is what he says about Socrates. His is the aggressive outreach, the indiscriminate address to all and sundry of the street evangelist. If you speak Greek and are willing to talk and reason, you can be Socrates' partner in searching with a prospect 
the truth undisclosed in countless ages might be discovered here and now on this very spot in the next 40 minutes between the two of you. Well, uh, I read that out a bit satirically because it is trying to whip up a bit of a storm. In fact, it reminds me of a, of a joke that Kierkegaard made about Hegel, who was devising a very great metaphysical system. And Kierkegaard writes uh, that it's, the news is, has arrived even in sleepy Copenhagen that Hegel's system is going to be finished next Sunday. So, so it has a bit of a tone about that. But what's interesting about this uh, is, is that uh, if you think that Socrates uh, was passionately searching for a truth that might be disclosed in the next 40 minutes or the next week or the next month or the next year or maybe in his lifetime or but maybe even not then but by followers afterwards, it was something that as Vlastos um, makes clear here, would, could come at a determinate time and could, in principle, come in Socrates' own lifetime that he might, in fact, think, rightly or wrongly, uh, that he had come across the truths that he was searching for. And then, uh, presumably, he might retire and spend more time with Mrs. Socrates uh, and uh, write his memoirs uh, or reply to critics uh, or whatever. At any rate, he might think he's finished his task because uh, he's discovered that truth. But it seems to me, uh, thinking about the character we have in, Socrates, uh, in Plato's dialogues, uh, that the Socrates we're presented with could never stop philosophizing. And that's not because, as a matter of fact, we suspect that what he's seeking for is so difficult to find that he won't find it. That's not the reason. It's not, as it were, the contingent limitations on his epistemic abilities. Not that he's, if he, it's not as though we could think, God, if only he were a lot more cleverer, maybe he could do it, even in this lifetime. It's got nothing to do with his contingent limitations. It's got something to do with the very nature of that quest. And in fact, uh, I think he expresses that jokingly at one stage, uh, also at his trial when he says uh, that if there is an afterlife, he expects that he'll be doing there uh, what he was doing here, uh, namely asking questions of himself and of others. Uh, that, that also reminds me by the... Oh, no, <laughs> there's a tent. Uh, there's so many wonderful stories about Socrates, there's a temptation to tell too many of them. But this... but. Uh, if I'm right about this, that is, that is what the character presents us with is someone who could not stop philosophizing and not because of any contingent limitations on his powers, his intellectual or epistemic powers, then he couldn't have been consistently with being that character, be seeking for a theory of something or other because a theory is ex hypothesis, something that could be finished at a particular time. And if it's not finished at that particular time, then it will be because of the contingent limitations of your cognitive powers and so on. Uh, so whatever truth comes to when one says Socrates was concerned for the truth about ethical matters, and I'm not for one minute suggesting we shouldn't say such a thing, but we ought to remember this when we think about what truth might come to uh, in such a claim. And it has, uh, it, it, it has deep implications, not only for his conception of what thinking about how to live, he said the most important thing one can do is to think about how to live. It not only says something about his conception of what kinds of issues are involved in that, it says something about his conception of the very nature of philosophy. Some people think of, of, of philosophy as essentially being defined by problems that could be characterized quite independently of, any, of, of the way in which the spirit in which those problems are tackled. So, so someone might say philosophy is concerned with how one should live, or someone might say, amongst other things, it's concerned with the problem of the freedom of the will, etc., etc. Characterize it by a set of distinctive problems distinguished from other disciplines. <coughs> 
But I don't think Socrates thought that. I think if one wanted to characterize why it was that he could not stop philosophizing, one would have to characterize a kind of spiritual relation to his quest. Wittgenstein, in fact, said something very similar to one of his well-known pupils called Russ Rees uh, when he was talking about philosophy. And he said to Rees, go the bloody hard way. And it was Rees reports that it was clear he wasn't saying, uh, do the hard end of the subject, logic or whatever. I remember when I was a student here, the professor said, ethics, that's for girls. He wasn't saying that sort of thing. <laughs> wasn't saying, logic, that's the hard way, go that way. He wasn't saying that. And nor was he saying, this is such a hard subject, you have to go the bloody hard way, because otherwise you'll get nowhere. Because that would suggest that some people who are much, much cleverer needn't go, go it quite so hard as he thought Rees had to go it. So he wasn't saying, Rees, look, you're not such a clever fellow as some others, like Russell, for example, you'd better go the hard way. No, he was characterising a kind of... He was characterising what he thought one's spiritual relation to the subject should be, such that he characterised his very conception of what it was to do philosophy. And I think the same thing uh, is true when one thinks about Plato, Plato's character, Socrates, and asks oneself, why was it not possible for him to stop philosophizing? And as I say, that, that's a question about the character. The actual historical Socrates may have stopped philosophizing and done exactly what satirically I said he might do, say, spend more time with Mrs. Socrates or whatever. But the character, could no, the character could no more stop philosophizing than Macbeth could repent of his killing of Duncan. Well, it's ironic, actually, that the, um, the distrust of the dramatic uh, dimension of the Platonic dialogues, the tendency to regard them as utterly extraneous to the philosophical content, is... Is, is often attributed to Socrates himself, not, of course, in relation to these dialogues, but the distrust of art is often attributed to Socrates himself. And in a dialogue called the Gorgias, the first part of which is concerned to establish the difference between oratory or rhetoric uh, and philosophy, uh, commentators often say about that that Socrates wanted to say that oratory was a disreputable practice uh, because it essentially aimed below the intellectual belt, aimed always to persuade, irregardless of the truth, whereas, so whereas but people say, Socrates thought that philosophy was essentially concerned with reason uh, and tried to persuade only in the light of reason. Now, the so I, once again, I think if, if one thinks about the character, uh, that becomes rather problematic. One of the reasons why the uh, orators uh, were able to do what they did, uh, that is to persuade people, uh, even though they shouldn't have been persuaded uh, by appealing to their emotions or whatever, uh, is because they often move people. They're often very charismatic. Uh, figures, powerful personalities, uh, and they deployed uh, the power of their personalities often to persuade people when they shouldn't have been persuaded. And of course, everybody notices this all the time, and one might generalize this to art, that art often persuades uh, when it shouldn't persuade. Uh, uh, I recently saw, for example, a, a film called The Reader, it's, uh, m many of you may have seen it because it's, uh, because Kate Winslet was nominated, well, she actually she got an Oscar for the performance, uh, which uh, as, as, as you know was, was about how a person responded uh, when he realised that someone he had fallen in love with uh, had in fact committed terrible crimes in Auschwitz and elsewhere. Uh, and uh, it, it's, it's adapted from a book, and it, it's obviously meant to be a serious film. Uh, there are all many signs that they try to make it a serious film. Uh, 
But when I watched it, I was so angered by the fact that the music was constantly swelling in a manip manipulative way, <laughs> as such that I felt it was impossible for anybody to go outside of that theatre trusting their response to uh, what had happened. Uh, you'd, I felt you'd have to see the film at least twice uh, in order to uh, determine whether you had been illegitimately moved by the music or whether the music had been intrinsic uh, to the content and in such a way that you would consent to the way in which you were moved by it. Now the way I've just spoken about consenting to being moved and standing back critically from being moved it's just a commonplace, uh, in it, uh, would be a commonplace for anybody who thinks about art at all, uh, that, that one has to keep one's critical faculties uh, about one when one is moved, because one can be moved because one's sentimental, or because one yields too often to pathos, uh, or because one is in various ways tone deaf to irony and to God knows what. Uh, the, these are, these are uh, uh, the, these things I've mentioned, uh, I sometimes call critical concepts. That is, that they're concepts with which we assess whether we're thinking well or badly when we're thinking about what has moved us. And to tell the truth, it seems to me that when people say that Socrates appeal to reason, whereas the orators appeal to emotion, I want to say there's no such thing as reason. The only thing there is, the only thing there is, are ways of thinking, well or badly, about different kinds of things. And the concepts that tell us what it is to think well or badly about one kind of subject matter will not be concepts that tell us how to think well or badly about another. Uh, so, for example, uh, while it's bad to have a disposition to sentimentality uh, if one's thinking about literature, uh, the concept of sentimentality has no place whatsoever when one's thinking about a mathematical proof. Uh, nor does the concept of being turned off to irony get a grip when one's thinking about th equations in physics. I mean, that's, that's obvious. But these concepts are necessary if one thinks about how it is that one is being moved. And one thing that is evident from the dialogues, the Socratic dialogues, is that Socrates moved people enormously. Uh, he had a power of presence that is constantly being documented in the dialogues by Plato. And it's hard to think that Plato didn't know that, notice this. It's hard to think therefore, that he didn't ask himself the question, what's the difference between the way Socrates moves people when he does and elicits their consent when he moves them as he does? What's the difference between that and the way that the orators do it? Well, I think his answer... Oh, was that the Socratic, pre uh, the, the, the oratorical presence in oratory, the orator's presence in oratory, the charismatic personality of the orator is a kind of false semblance, a false semblance of the authentic presence in conversation of someone like Socrates. I don't think Plato wanted to say, look, from what moves you here when you're confronted with Socrates, you should extract what you take to be cognitive or intellectual content, extract it from the form in which it has moved you, write it on a blackboard, let's say, and assess it, independently of the fact that you are moved by it. Because that might suggest that someone like Polus, who's a character in the dialogue, might come across an argument to the, to the conclusion that it's better to suffer evil than to do it, written on a blackboard, just stumble across it, or even written in the sands by the wind, and think, my God, that's true, that's deep, that's profound. I think that's a kind of caricature of how we come to learn 
deep things in moral matters. But I'll, I'll leave, for the moment, I'll, I'll leave that point. Uh, and if, if I need to explain more, I'll do so in discussion. But, the, but the, the, the dominating idea here is that in order to uh, be critically responsive to being moved and to assenting to some new moral truth, if that's what it is, because you're moved, or when you say you came to see something you'd never seen before, or seen sense where you hadn't seen it before, only when you saw this film or read this poem, or only when so-and-so spoke those words that you'd heard so many times before but had never seen anything in. On those occasions, I'm suggesting the way in which Plato presents us with a character of Socrates ought to make us suspicious of what has become a kind of philosophical truism that when you moved, either by a person's presence, by their words, by their deeds, or moved by something in art, you need to extract from the form a cognitive content that is, as so to speak, ideally formless, that is ideally without tone. I'm suggesting you be suspicious of that particular conception of reason. And as for rationality, I'll, I'll just develop this point a little bit. Uh, as for uh, rationality, it's a necessary, but seems to me a very limited virtue. If you try to imagine somebody facing uh, their death, they've been told they have six months to live or something like that, and they're trying to die with some sort of lucidity, with clarity of mind, uh, then, of course, they need to be rational. Uh, they need uh, not to, um, uh, let's, let's say, uh, become gullible about snake oil remedies for this and for that, uh, but as well as that, uh, they need to resist sentimental consolations uh, about what it, is, what it is to die in this or that fashion. Or if someone says to them, uh, don't yield, uh, don't be so resigned, uh, uh, read this poem of Dylan Thomas about not going gently into that good night and so on. The person has to respond and ask, to that poem and ask, is this is this genuinely an authentic response to the fear of death, or is it posturing? Uh, is it a piece of romantic posturing? These are the kinds of critical categories that need to be deployed. And it would be a completely stretched concept of rationality that try to make them out to be aspects of rationality. And that's why I mean when I say rationality is a necessary, but a limited virtue when one's thinking about the kinds of problems that Socrates was thinking about, that is, to how to live, how to face the deep issues in life and in death. <clears throat>